Well, first of all, I would like to thank the International People's Assembly for inviting me to participate in this training session on the media and political communication. The part of my presentation has to do with a theoretical analysis, but also a practical one on the media and a critical analysis of the media in the 21st century. I think that, uh, as a matter of fact, It'd be interesting to have a general introduction, which is what I'm going to do, by taking into account the international nature of the media in a macro framework that allows us to understand how those categories that we are analyzing in the media can be adapted to the different realities, regional and international realities that we are interested in. Thus, we have uh, decided to have uh, a global approach so that uh, we can also have an approach on the political economy of communication instead of maybe just analyzing the different flows between journalists and audience. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, due to this global nature, general nature of the object of our study, I think it would be more interesting for us to have a macro framework, as I mentioned earlier. So what does it mean to have a macro framework? It means, first of all, to understand that modern media, and it is important to highlight here that we will further on make a difference between modern media and traditional media. But nowadays, modern media have a dual dimension. And they have a political one, on the one hand, because they shape the opinion of the public. They have a strong impact on politics, but they also have an economic dimension because media are a traditional business. They have their own products with their journals, films, series. They have a number of strategies by selecting multimedia products which turn into commodities uh, like any other business would do, as a matter of fact. And this means that there is a tendency that is being aggravated, a commercial tendency that means that uh, the main income for media are these products, through advertising specifically. And through advertising also, we, the audiences, the public, the subjects, turn into the product that, for instance, a TV channel can sell to companies who want to offer their advertising. We are the product. We are the product of the media for advertising companies. So this commodity, this nature, commercial nature, does not invalidate the role of media, but it must combine in this dual dimension the political part and the economic part, which obviously throughout, part, uh, throughout uh, time they, it, well, they end up configuring um, a structure, a property structure, which has become more and more complex and, uh, as a matter of fact, nowadays goes beyond the structures of property and are articulated within transnational companies that are part of that financial capitalism that we are going through nowadays. Thus, one of the analysis of the media as companies, as cultural industries, as information businesses, is that they are subject to the laws or the rules of the market, which means to obtaining the maximum profit possible at a lower cost, also at the, at the lowest cost possible, and uh, in a context that is more and more deregulated and liberalized in traditional companies, uh, not just in telecommunications, but even in transport services or post services, which have seen the trend towards privatization uh, had a strong impact on them. And we see that, that it has also turned into monopolies for the privatization and deregulation, a very intensive one in the last decades. And, well, there is a characteristic of, in all of this, which is that these companies are traditional industries, but the difference with other industries is that their products are ideas, ideologies, the transfer of values, of principles. Thus, 
For this uh, function, the function or the role of uh, companies, of the very specific characteristics that make them be within the uh, logics of capitalism, but at the same time they transfer ideas, meaning that they are controllers of the public opinion makes them have a status and a social influence that is always at the center of public discussion or debate. We talk about the exploitation of the media. Uh, we can also refer to electromagnetic waves, but it also means how we socialize citizenship. This is something I think that is common to all the different regions in the world, so it will not be surprising for you to understand that the media are actually uh, an important destabilizing entities and also create consensus in anti-democratic situations in certain realities. Also, nowadays, and with this I will be ending the introduction of my presentation, we are currently going through a digital uh, moment in what we call the information society. The current society model is referred to as a society of communication, of knowledge. This means that communication plays a central role nowadays and new technologies are at the center of understanding the main social changes in the last decades. This doesn't mean that new technologies are, are uh, the main factors for social change, but they have an important role nonetheless. In this information society we live in, we can see that the media follow the characteristics and the nature of other types of businesses in a capitalist environment, for instance, by having a trend towards more and more accumulation, vertical and horizontal one of property. We also have more monopolies and which end up belonging to large business conglomerates that have nothing to do whatsoever with the uh, communication field. And well, we see a strong capitalist trend which is, well, typical of capitalism, which is the expansion of capital at a global level. Nonetheless, it is not surprising to see how um, the CNN, Fox, or Prisa, in the case of Spain, and other entities with international nature have a strong presence of banks like uh, Banco Santander or BBVA, which are at the boards of directors of many communication businesses. This is important for us to understand the, the way of how media work, which are their um, limitations and what are their roles. When I mentioned that the idea is to have a macro analysis, I was referring to the critic to, of the economic politics of communication in order to establish an analysis of the media. Why should we use this framework? First of all, because studying the logics and laws of economics will allow us to understand which are the mechanisms governing the functioning of the media. And secondly, which are the mechanisms that will condition the, the channel, the sender, the activity of a newspaper, the activity of a radio, of a TV channel, but also the activity of showcasters and producers of information in general. Political economics and their logics allow us to understand why things nowadays with the media are the way they are. The political theory of communication is something that I think will sound familiar to you and that has always had a strong Marxist influence also of everything that Marx Engels mentioned but what we are interested in is the evolution 
that has had from the 60s and 70s forward from several theoretics in culture and especially the political dimensions of these large media companies. In this sense, it is important for us to take into account that the media are very complex organizations as cultural industries that are articulated with other institutions and that are part of the power institutions in our society nowadays. The media have a very intimate and strong relation with power structures, oligarchic ones, but also with power structures that dominate the nations, the states, and the different international institutions, but also at the local level level, province level, or regional level. Why is this approach, this approach of the political economics useful to us? First of all, because as I mentioned earlier, it has a macro-social approach, and it has to do with the global level of the media. It would not make any sense for us to have analysis of the media, of the media by not taking into account their global nature with a holistic analysis or by studying only local or regional media, but also because this perspective provides us with a historical analysis and perspective of social processes and the evolution of the relations between institutions and governments, also because it emphasizes the intention, the goals of the media with society does, it allows us to have a holistic perspective and understand how the media are part of a much more complex structure with uh, the distribution, unbalanced distribution of power. And lastly, because in the economic theory, it is very important to take into account the practice, the practical part of the dimensions it has, not only in theory, but also in practice, in the practice of also trying to understand and have alternatives to the current media in global capitalism. So basically, what I would like to and what I would like us sorry, to, uh, to understand in cultural and political communication is what I mentioned earlier as our main analysis, which are cultural industries within capitalism, understanding this as a model for economic development, but also for social organization. Here it is where media businesses have an important role, not only in the economic field, but also when it comes to the organization of societies. It is also important for us to understand which have been the changes that these media businesses have gone through in the last decades. I think that there are two main turning points in the evolution of information structures. First of all, we must go back to the 70s, maybe 80s, when there was an international discussion on culture and communication, very much linked to the theoretical discussions on the economic dependence on the imperialist theory, the neoclassical economic imperialistic theory that did not take into account the uh, dependence of southern countries and the northern countries. But this is also about denouncing the lack of balance at the global level between the different media in the different regions. In this period, in the 70s and 80s, there was a strong turning point that was symbolized in an important report published by UNESCO, which was titled Many Voices, One World, and which was published by Sean McBride, and which emphasized the exit of countries like the United States, of UNESCO, with claims of proto-socialism, and which was uh, this report, which, which was actually denouncing the imperialist theories of communication and their role within the international scale. We are currently going through a turning point, not only of new technologies, but also of a strong 
of strong crisis, especially in some regions more than others, and which has led to a new, a new stage in regards to the global systems of capitalism within these stages. We have very rich, rich experiences, like in Latin America, from uh, what we call the golden age of the two first decades of the century. Here we saw how in countries like Venezuela, Argentina, Brazil, Ecuador, Bolivia, we had the number of progressive governments that put on the table a number of initiatives to regulate, but also to launch new communication platforms. Such was the case of Telesur. These were public platforms because they had the support of states, of governments, but which were also uh, aimed at making a difference when it came to providing alternatives to the media, alternatives that uh, uh, I hope we will be able to discuss afterwards, and which are also uh, being attacked by imperialist uh, countries like United States because they mean not only a turning point in, uh, from an economic perspective, but also in the way we understand the organization of society and, and in a way of understanding democracy and politics. Well, we were referring to the industrial nature of culture, of cultural industries, and how there are trends that are determining the way that these cultural industries function, not only in the accumulation of capital in the knowledge industries, but also those logics, those economic and political logics that we also mentioned earlier, that are trying to obtain the maximum profit possible at a lowest cost, and how the different property structures are affecting the way that professionals work, professionals in the communications sector, which affect obviously the internal routines in these structures, and which also conditioning the quality of information. This is an economic and political logic that has a direct impact in the quality of the information and communications that we receive and which we also need to approach and develop. For instance, nowadays, journalists are working more and more thanks to new technologies, but nonetheless have less and less time for them to have a good uh, research work, a quality one. And thus, we have more and more superficial news. Nowadays, uh, journalists no longer have, for instance, a whole week to analyze a piece of news, and they also additionally need to add a picture or an additional item to that piece of news. Another good example would be the high dependence of media on certain businesses. It's too expensive to send a journalist to an area of conflict or a conflict zone in another part of the world. So it is more cheap and less expensive to receive information from big, big media sources. This is also important in order to understand the current configuration of the world systems of information and understand the main lines of information. There are three main research lines that can allow us to better understand how media work or function nowadays in the 21st century. These three research lines from a cultural perspective has been developed from the 60s and 70s already. There was a first one, which is maybe the most uh, well-known one, which is a study of the property of the media, the structure of the property of those media, and which also includes which are the financing mechanisms of those large structures, which is not only advertising, but sometimes also by receiving subsidies from the state. And this has an impact on the structure and content of information. For instance, how can we talk about a case of corruption of an entity, a communication entity that is dependent on a large business where the case of corruption has taken place? 
countries. We have a good example of this in Spain in the crisis of 2008, where there was a strong information bias on Banco Santander when it tried to rescue large financial uh, companies, and actually uh, Prisa had an important role there, and there is a, an analysis which we carried out on how Prisa, Prisa Group was not really analyzing or communicating well what was happening in this case, and how this also had a strong impact on the way we understood the 2008 crisis in Spain. Of course, the study of this structure has had an evolution in the last 10-15 uh, years with the financial capitalism and the new logics of what we call digital capitalism. What does this mean? It means that if in the past large corporations had their headquarters in a country and moved around the world as an external force with a national flag. Nowadays, these industries are more and more integrated in businesses, in large societies, in such a way that sometimes it is difficult to know what their real nationality is and how they are linked to the interest of a certain state or government. They have certain alliances, partners, they have alliances with hosting countries. This means that we go from speaking about the impact of capitalism in the field of information, multinationals in the 60s and 70s, to have to speak more and more about a transnational communication business and transnational companies that have a strong influence in many parts of the world. Not only in the West, there are also many economies, emerging companies, sometimes even countries like China, which are trying to standardize that transnational economy. In the past days, we have received news, for instance, on the conflict between China and the United States, and how the United States wants to forbid the uh, social network TikTok, but also all those companies that have their services based in China. I think that this is a good example for us to understand how these new transnational economies are organizing themselves and um, being shaped up. I think this is precisely a good example on how to understand how the articulation of these transnational economies. And this example also of TikTok and the conflict between the United States and China, what it shows is that studying nowadays the interest of the media would not be a complete analysis, it would not be adequate if we don't also analyze who are exercising the power. For example, Chinese executives who had a strong control over IBM computers shows us also this intimate and strong relation between the political and economic power at a transnational level. And it is not something that we can understand under a single flag. There is also a growing tension in these transnational economies in the interests of countries whose economic power is in decline uh, without wanting to add any controversy with, to this, which is the current case of the United States. This would be a first line to understand the functioning of the media in the 21st century. There is a second one, which is also very interesting in the theories of political economy, which is how to understand information and culture as a product. I'm sure that also you are also familiar with the fact that many media are also providing an ideology and the impact they have on people, how they are transferring a certain ideology that tries to perpetuate certain power structures on society as a whole and sometimes even against the interest of that same society. Thus, media are apparatus of ideology that recreate those structures of power and when there is a dispute between different cultural products, although this is uh, not something that is mechanized or that can be reproduced in uh, one-way direction because it is a very complex 
uh, process. But today, there is a clear manipulative goal from the media for cultural reproduction in certain series or films that we see on TV. There is a work that I find very interesting, an author who's called Harry Schiller, who published a very interesting work in the 70s, and I think that it's something that we can still take into account, which are the myths that are reproduced through the cultural industry, the entertainment industry, and which can also allow us to understand how the media are still perpetuating a number of ideas. The work is from 1974, if I recall well, which is called Free Enterprise and Media. It refers to four myths of the media. The first myth is the myth of individualism, a myth where we try to have more individual skills and individual American lifestyle, which was characterized by, uh, sorry, through the denounces and reports of southern countries of the American lifestyle, which was based on neoliberalism, the neoliberalism at the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s and which were quite successful in the realities of many of our countries. There is a second myth, the myth of neutrality. So that manipulation is effective, we must not perceive that such manipulation is taking place. And this is the reason why media are constantly trying to produce that certain neutrality. Neutrality in the processes of transformation, for example, at a regional level, for example, there is a supposed neutrality of judicial powers. These are a number of neutral principles of the police, of the also the judicial forces, and which are difficult to struggle against if we believe that, that they are really neutral, that the forces of order are democratic, but as a matter of fact, they are a response of those same powers of structures, and the and media are actually also expanding that myth of neutrality when we, for example, understand that the media are the fourth power, that there are a sort of guard of the executive power. This is not really true. This is a myth and media, and but also through film series and daily um, information that we see on the news, we find that myth once and again. The third myth would be the one on social conflicts, which are presented as individual conflicts, which disguise or do not show which are the real conflicts behind. And there is a lack of explanation on why there are sometimes class struggles in certain conflicts that arise and that we can find in many headlines and journals and on TV or the timelines of uh, Twitter, Facebook and other social networks, meaning that there is a sort of rejection of social conflict by naturalizing and making it normal that there are unbalanced social relations between different classes. There is an antagonistic reality that is not shown. And there is a fourth myth spread by the media, which is also a problem when it comes to the ecology in the information, in receiving an information that is clean, which is the myth that the more channels we have, or the more journals we have, or the more radios we have, the more democratic society is, and the more information we have, which is not true. There are more and more media. The technological change has allowed more and more ways of communication, but the massive content of all those channels is more and more poor, and it's less and less diverse. It's more monolithical, it's more uniform, it's more poor.
for instance, in the ways of political communication throughout time that even passed in, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, there are studies, quality studies, that show that political discussions in the United States in the 60s and 70s were more, much more rich in content than nowadays not only in traditional media, but also in social networks like uh, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, etc. This is another thing that political economy allows us to better understand. There is another research line, which is the analysis of public policies when it comes to information and how these public policies have an impact not only in our behavior, but also and the contents that we receive. This is important to understand how power, uh, sorry, public powers and how organized society is able to access power. This allows us to regulate the spaces for communication and that they need to be regulated. When communications are not regulated, it doesn't mean that there is a lack of public policies, but a lack of regulation in the market, which will never regulate or which should regulate these communications. So in this sense, it is important to emphasize the different traditions, communication traditions that we have, for instance, in Europe, and how we develop this in a public way through, of course, public policies for communication. The state has been one of the important centers of communication information in European countries since massive radio diffusion. This is important not only for a critical analysis on how the state uses the media, but it's also important to emphasize the fact that it will always be much more democratic for a media to be to have to respond to a parliament or the Congress than having to respond to a board of directors of industrial or political financial entities. In this sense, there is a large tradition uh, when it comes to regulating and demanding the regulation of communication, private communication, the development of educational and audiovisual policies in order to integrate other forms of communication for full democracy. We mentioned earlier the case of Latin America. The case of Latin America is especially interesting, especially if we look at what some countries have done in the past years, uh, unfortunately. Uh, this is nowadays uh, uh, no longer possible. Uh, there was a lack of tradition of communication agencies in the past and in the regional framework when this alternative agenda for communication information that we developed, this was aimed at popular movements more than at the interests of transnational oligarchies in the South. Unfortunately, uh, this is something that is being dismantled nowadays, but it is important also to take those experiences, that we take them into account, how they have been able to develop a more sense of community in popular communication, and which has been strongly implemented due precisely to the lack of certain media in certain parts of Latin America, and how with that golden age of the progressive government in Latin America, there were a number of public policies developed. Yes, they did have some limitations, but they were very new. They were very interesting in order to develop other forms of communication. Finally, I would like to uh, also make a reflection on what the transition has been like, the transition of traditional media towards modern media, new media. And it's important here to put on the table a discussion that has taken place and which is the one that uh, in the last, uh, well, in the 19th century already also took place through the, well, the upsurge of uh, other forms of telecommunications like telephones and new technologies, internet and new experiences with social networks. Innovation and technological 
innovation specifically has always come with wake up of certain conflict processes, meaning, for example, a telephone, radio were always seen like tools that would allow to establish a better and more communication between different peoples at a worldwide level, and this supposedly would also improve popular movements and processes and democracy. Nonetheless, we find that there is a lack of understanding, a translation of language. The problem of democracy at a global level has more to do with the logics of economy and politics than with communication itself or with how we can interconnect different types of contents at a global level. Nowadays, through internet, we find that there is a continuity more than a breaking from the traditional media. And as a matter of fact, they expand those trends that already existed before avoiding the possibility of also finding new alternatives. Communities and audiences are completely commercialized. But nowadays, with Twitter and Facebook and other digital platforms and multimedia journalism, we are still seeing a more deep process of commodification. Thus, we still find that there is a, a phenomenon of certain countries over others. We still find a division between the rich and the poor, and that technologies are at the service of military interest of nations under dispute. And as uh, Schiller has said, son of Herbert Schiller, who we mentioned earlier when we spoke about the myths, as his son said, the new media can talk about digital capitalism, but it is still capitalism nonetheless. And this is very important to take into account. The important thing is capitalism and not just the digital part. It's important also to emphasize the social changes that he, this has brought, especially in the 90s, the first decade of the 21st century. If in the past we talked about media with a strong national component, we find more and more a cultural industry at an international level that is subjugated to certain power structures. For example, today, the regulation processes that are necessary to coordinate something as easy and as routine as the addresses, the IP addresses on the internet, which are only linked to a certain power structure. And one of the main reunifications for this is that this entity can be regulated and that we can regulate internet addresses in the global network. Nonetheless, and I do not want to finish my presentation without adding this reflection, a reflection on the practice that is dominant in the research lines and fields of political economy, I'd like to emphasize the lack of balance between southern and northern, and northern countries, we should maybe talk about those that have no possessions, those of us who are in the peripheries, whereas there are others who are at the center of global capitalism. We should also mention that with new technologies, there are new sorts of crises, new processes, that can be taken by popular movements in order to create alternatives. Nowadays, it is more and more difficult for capitalism to have an appropriation of information and knowledge. Capitalism in cultural industries has always gone from the gain of profit through property rights. But nowadays, this strategy, this privatization strategy is more and more difficult. For example, in cultural works, because their origin is in popular trends, this is more and more difficult, and thus the common knowledge are more and more overwhelming 
and this is thanks to new technologies also. This is something to also take into account. That this also provides new opportunities, new mechanisms for participation. So we should affirm that power is able to control and direct a larger number of people. For example, Google, the way we see that it works, its algorithms, its search engines, its uh, mechanism of control that is very important to take into account. But it's also important to know that technology tools also allow many popular and social movements to connect. And thanks to this, social movements are also able to mobilize and coordinate their activities in a way that we had never seen before. And as a matter of fact, the school you are now participating in is a good example of this, of the abilities for new technologies to connect people. And finally, this also allows us to have new forms of activism through social networks. We have the examples of uh, democratization of internet, free software, free press is another good example in the United States for popular communication in Latin America also. We also have examples in Asia and Africa, the free software movement, which is very important in uh, not only hacktivist communities, but also in uh, communities that reject uh, Microsoft or Apple and their interests. There are also very interesting, very interesting experiences of activism through other platforms like the launching of uh, Telesur. And we can also see this, how there are growing platforms also, alternative ones. These are also good examples of how new technologies allow new forms of activism that put on the table very direct and specific alternatives to those privatizing logics, the, results, those, the logic, sorry, of, of accumulation of capital that dominate today. And this is very important to also mention. Because when we talk about digital capitalism, we must take into account that we are still referring to capitalism. The digital field brings new opportunities, but it's important to have this within processes that are participatory, that are democratic in the media at a global scale and not for the interest of certain boards of directors with certain communication strategies. Um, nothing else on my side. I hope that this analysis, this macro analysis of the reality of the media in the 21st century are useful for us to understand more practical issues that I hope we can also talk about later on. Thank you very much. I send you all my regards and uh, have good work.